Well, good evening, everybody, wherever you're watching around the world. This is Vinny Sandu here, Mr. Maximo from the European Cricket Network with another episode of European Cricket Studio Live here. And it's a Thursday night, and that means it's time for Maximo Chat, which is one of my favourite, if not my favourite, shows that I get to do in the week where I get a special guest from the cricket world and we get to talk for an hour about whatever you like. So this is all about you guys. Uh, whatever questions you want to send in, some have been sent in already. So please feel free to uh, get interactive, put the questions down the bottom in the comments, or you can send them through the special question facility in this Instagram Live broadcast. So uh, just a reminder, if you're new to European Cricket Studio, make sure you follow at European Cricket on Instagram. We do shows four nights a week, Monday to Thursday at the same time each day, this time 5 p.m. in Central Europe. Well, my guest today, I loved having him on the Maximo Show on Tuesday night. He's represented Australia 18 times uh, in limited overs cricket. And he's also played in England for the Sussex Sharks. He's played in Australia Big Bash League for Perth Scorchers. And of course, who could forget his performances for the Mumbai Indians in the Indian Premier League. So please welcome Australian fast bowler, Jason Berendorf. Hey, how are you, Vinny? I'm very well. How are you today? Yeah, yeah Jason. going well, thanks. Looking pretty cool with the AirPods there. Hopefully they do the job and you can hear me loud and clear. And I don't yeah, think I've gotcha. seen you too often in your glasses. Just, just, just quickly, is that something that's... Uh, do you wear contacts when you play cricket or uh, are you not that bad with your glasses? You only need them for certain things? Yeah, no, I do wear contacts now. So um, it actually all started on my honeymoon when my wife pointed out a sign in the distance and said, oh, that's interesting. And I said, what? And she said, what do you mean? It's clear as day and I couldn't see a thing. So, um, yeah, so I got my eyes checked and, yeah, lo and behold, I needed some uh, some contacts and some glasses. Well, maybe you had an excuse for some of your batting, but uh, we, won't, we won't get into that, uh, Jason, <laughs> at the moment. Of course, you know more of your performance with the ball, but actually uh, we got quite a few questions about something that wasn't cricket related uh, that we were talking about the other night. And we had yeah. so many questions asking, how did Harrison's birthday go yesterday? It was really, really good, mate. Um, so obviously being in isolation, it was like there was no party as such for him. We were keen to do something um, to still celebrate his birthday. So we put up some streamers and I blew up about 40 or 50 balloons. And um, yeah, we got a, a nice cake made for him. And um, yeah, there were lots of presents. We had some presents sent from uncles and aunties and grandparents around Australia and, um, and even some that live over in the UK. So he was very spoilt. Um, he had, uh, yeah, an amazing day and was absolutely exhausted by the end of it, and so were we. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I bet. And, yeah, it's a weird thing at the moment, isn't it? You have, you have children's parties with uh, no people except the immediate family, no grandparents, yeah. no none of these things. And I know we had a, a Zoom, attempted Zoom first birthday party for my niece last week, and that went about as well as it sounds. We had people from all around the world. So, yeah, we're still getting a handle on these things, but we're all adapting as well as we can. And, of course, not to forget that you've got a birthday coming up next week. Now, tell me, what did you think you'd be doing on your birthday and what will you actually be doing on your 30th birthday next week? Well, I found out, um, actually, my 30th originally was going to be a, I was going to have a trip to Melbourne with my wife um, because she was teaching in Melbourne the week after. So we were going to spend the weekend together and then I was going to head back home. Um, so that was going to be nice. Uh, but then obviously that's been canned. And um, I found out as well, she actually had planned a surprise birthday party for me. Um, so that was, I'm not sure what date that was going to be, whether it was going to be before or after, but um, she'd planned it and it was going to be a 90s dress up theme. And now that I've found out about it and it's not going ahead, I'm actually quite disappointed. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, so we've even even toyed up with the idea, do we still dress up and just have dinner at home? So maybe we'll do that. Actually, I, I can only tell you this now. Actually, I was invited to your surprise 30th birthday, but I was actually meant to be playing cricket in Spain next week um, for my there birthday. So I said, sorry, I can't come. But I guess I can come now, except now nothing's happening in the world. So that's just uh, the way we're living. <laughs> now, I love having people in the comments saying where you're watching from. We saw someone watching from New York City. So welcome to you. 
And, That's um, right. and it's just fantastic to have uh, so many different people watching from different places. So um, whether you've stumbled upon this show and you're not a huge Cricket fan or you are, we try and provide some entertainment for you. Uh, so I think that I will move on to the first question we've got. And this is a little bit cricket related. And this is something I was wondering, actually, Jason. This comes from Graham Antle in Belfast in Northern Ireland. And he wants to know, do you still have aspirations to play test cricket? Of course, um, we know you've had some injury worries um, and, you, and you're kind of a white ball specialist at this point. But do you still have that dream to wear the baggy green cap of Australia in test cricket in the future? Yeah, I certainly do. Um, and that's something that uh, going through the last, oh, it's been about six or seven months now since I had back surgery. Um, and that was one of the, the big drivers to have surgery was that it would hopefully give me a chance to play test cricket and, and four day cricket. So James Pattinson had the surgery done as well. He's had that uh, for a few years now and, and he's back playing test cricket and playing Red Bull cricket and going really well. So um, that's something for me that I still aspire to do. Um, and it's going to be a gradual process to get there though. So starting with when I get back up and running and the season starts or whenever I'm able to play some cricket again, um, we'll start with some white ball cricket and, and gradually build up from there. So yeah, fingers crossed. Yeah. Well, I wish you all the best. And we know um, fast bowling, it does put a lot of stress on the body, even when you've got quite, quite a nice action that you've got. Um, and so <laughs> you, you hopefully wouldn't anticipate to have these kind of injuries, but uh, we would certainly wish you all the best and, and really that you've made it so far in your career already um, as a former teammate, I'm very proud of you, but We'd love to see you realise that dream, which is every little Australian kid's dream to, uh, to, to pull on the baggy green and play test cricket. Now, I've got another question here, and this came from uh, Banu is Unique, and he would like to know, who is your best friend in the Australian team? I've got a few now. Um, so I get along, obviously, really well with a lot of the WA boys, so some of the guys that have been involved a fair bit when I've been, been playing are guys like Ashton Agar, Ashton Turner, um, Darcy Short. Um, and then uh, also get along really well with the, the fast bowling cartel. Um, so that's, that's a pretty obvious one. But Nathan Lyon sticks out for me, um, mainly because I've known Nathan since we were about, uh, I was probably about 16 and, and he's a few years older than me. Um, what we were growing up, he was from young in, in country New South Wales and, and I played a lot of my cricket in Canberra growing up and, and we actually both represented the ACT at the same time. So we've had a fair bit of history together, Nathan and I. Ah, and Banu is, is a she, just getting some confirmation. So thanks, Banu. Sorry, I, I might have said he, but uh, Banu that's, has actually sent in quite a few questions. So that's just one of them that we've got to. So that's, that's interesting. And I didn't realise you had uh, that relationship with uh, Nathan Lyon going back so far. So that's something I've learned. Of course, I did know you came across the country to develop your cricket in Western Australia, which, of course, is my hometown. Now, this could be from anywhere. This next question comes from Michael McCann, who, of course, hosts the show on Monday and Wednesday nights. And he wants to know, Who's the player you've played with that you've learned the most of? So, of course, you've had the opportunity now to play uh, all around the world and with some opponents becoming teammates. So who have you learned the most of by playing with them? Yeah, there's a couple that come to mind. So um, Mitchell McLennigan, um, who played for New Zealand. Um, I played with him uh, in the IPL at Mumbai. Um, and being a fellow left armour, it was really great to chat with him um, a lot about bowling plans, um, setting different fields. Um, and the thing that Mitch was really keen on and really big on was being a bit more, I guess, setting fields that you're, you're not usually so accustomed to. So maybe having your third man up and having a deep point instead or, or whatever it might be and actually um, sort of challenge the thinking of the batter, uh, which was really cool. And, um, and the other guy as well, um, Jasper Boomer. Um, again, played with him at Mumbai and I've played against him um, playing for Australia and, um, and such an amazing talent on the cricket field. And, and just to, to chat to him about ways he bowls his Yorkers and tries to bowl his slower balls. And uh, he's always seeming to, to work on something different. So it was good to chat to him uh, to figure out different ways to try and go about it as well. Do you find that the Indian players or, or the international players are quite open with you when you're playing in franchise cricket? Or do you feel like they're perhaps holding something a bit close to their chest in case they have to use it against you. I'm really interested about the dynamics of this because it's a fairly recent phenomenon in cricket where the players do mix and become teammates for these, for these franchises. So what's your opinion on that? Yeah, it is. Um, I actually felt probably the most comfortable walking into the Mumbai dressing room that I've felt um, going into a new new setup. Um, I, I was really welcomed by, firstly, by Rohit Sharma, the captain, and then everyone 
um, playing within the squad and also all of the, the staff um, and the owners and everyone. Everyone was amazing there. Um, so I had the, the best time there um, and everything, everyone shared everything, which was great. Um, obviously, there'll be a few little secrets that you'll, you'll keep to yourself and you, you want to make sure you try and still have the, the wood over different guys when you're playing against them in whether it be domestically or international cricket. Um, but it's some of those things that, yeah, everyone's a, a cricketer and we're all going through the same thing, whether you're, you're Indian, Australian, English, South African, um, we're all playing the same game and trying to do the same thing. So it's, it's really nice to share ideas and, and I've found most guys to be pretty open. Yeah, it is true, isn't it? That, that the cricket is really a global community and it's become that way. And at times like this, I think we all just miss cricket. We've all got so much in common and we can't wait to get back out there playing cricket and watching high level cricket and hopefully seeing you playing again the IPL. I think that would be... That would be pretty exciting. Now, just a reminder, guys, this is all about you. So put your questions in the comments or you can put them in the question section of the Instagram Live. You can click the little uh, question mark down the bottom. And we've had one come through on the question bar. And this is from Mark Lovell. And he asks this question. It says, is Jason qualified to play for Germany like Shane Warne? <laughs> I didn't know this. <laughs> but why don't you tell us a bit, more about your heri- a bit more about your heritage and your European background? Because it's quite an interesting story, isn't it? Yeah, it is. So um, as, as I've been told during the First World War, um, Berendorf, originally with 1F, uh, being German, um, Germans were getting locked up in the First World War within Australia. Um, so they changed it to 2Fs to look and, and sound more Dutch. Um, so that's something that they did in the, in the sense to go, well, yeah, if Germans are getting locked up, let's try and get around yeah. this somehow. Um, and also I found that Berendorf means uh, bear in the village. And um, <laughs> in the Black Forest, um, we were like, we were around the Black Forest and, and we were the one that kept the bears out. So yeah, if we saw a black bear, <laughs> we ran straight for it and chased it back into the Black Forest. Well, that is something I did not know. I think you can probably chase down a bear on those long legs. <laughs> um, but that's, that is something incredible, and I didn't know about you. But we're not sure if you do qualify to play for Germany, but if you did, I'm I sure the German so. team would be happy. No, we've had some Australians with some European heritage play. I know Dirk Nannis, uh, former Australian T20 and ODI international, played for the Netherlands, I believe. And mm. we've had a few other domestic players like uh, Tom Cooper, I think. And, yeah, Michael um, Swart as well. Michael Swart, who, who uh, I know and t- tells me he's the number five all-rounder in the world at some point. Because he, wow. he took, took you know, I think he played two games, and so he hasn't <laughs> lived that one down for a while. Um, yeah, so yeah, guys, uh, we do appreciate you, and I'm trying to say hi to everyone in the chat. Thanks for thanks for uh, in, contributing to the discussion. We've seen some people say that you and AB de Villiers have the have the nicest smiles in world cricket. Well, there's that's probably the only wow. way you're going to be compared to AB de Villiers. Uh, Jason? If, if, yeah, I'm not, not if, quite 360 with the bat, am I? <laughs> if, if I'm going to be completely honest. Now, we've got some more uh, questions coming in. And I'm just going to pick one out for you. And, oh, yeah, this is a good one. What is, this is from Barnu again. She has asked us, uh, what is your favourite wicket of your career? And you've actually got a few big ones to choose from, don't you? Yeah. Um, oh, um, it's really hard to have a favourite. Um, the a couple that spring to mind um, would be in one of my first international games um, when I got Rohit Sharma out um, and also got Virat Kohli out in those game uh, in that game. Um, one that goes back a little bit further than that, I actually got Sachin Tendulkar out for a duck um, playing for the Perth Scorchers against the Mumbai Indians in the Champions League. Um, and so that was that was really special looking back at that one. Um, and another one that was um, that sort of springs to mind uh, more recently was getting James Vince out uh, in the World Cup at Lords. Um, that was a memorable but, ball, wasn't it? Yeah, that was that was the one as a as a left armer in particular, um, trying to swing the ball back to the right handers. Um, virtually the perfect ball is what you what you aim for, and, and you want the one to swing back, go between bat and pad, and, and knock the stumps over. So that for me was was one of right up there. And, and I've heard swing bowling is like that, isn't it? You're trying to do something all the time, but once the ball leaves your hand, it's kind of out of your control, isn't it? So um, every so often you do get a ball that just does exactly what you want it to do. And that's what that Vince ball had that kind of feeling. Is that what it felt like when you saw what happened after the ball left your hand? Yeah, that was exactly right. So 
Um, it's one of those things where I actually thought the ball was too full when I first let it go. And then it swung really late. Um, and that's, as, as a fast bowler, as a, as a swing bowler, that's what you want the, the ball to do. You want it to swing as late as possible so the batters don't have any chance um, to do that. Um, to make an adjustment, basically. So, yeah, that was that was really cool. Yeah, well, we won't forget that, of course. Um, another one I'd throw in there, if, you, if we're talking big scalps, I think you've got Chris Gale, Chris Gale out more than once. Am I right in saying that? I know you've definitely got him out uh, at least once in the Big Bash League. Uh, yeah, so I got him out. Um, I'm pretty sure he was playing for the Sydney Thunder at the time uh, when we were playing still at the Wacker. Um, from memory, I think I might have nicked him off to first slip, maybe. I think you did. Um, and then I actually got him out in the IPL as well. Um, that one, not as conventional. I got him caught on the fence at deep mid-wicket. So, but it still counts. Well, still counts. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, and you must be so happy to see the back of a player like Chris Gale. You know, you could be so damaging. So that's, that's, I remember the time you did at the Wacker. You made him blush, didn't you, when you nicked him off in the first over. So uh, <laughs> I think that will be right up there in, in your big wickets. And that kind of leads us to, to another uh, question from Tariq. Uh, Tariq is in uh, Colmar in France, and he's a, he's a European cricketer. And he had a question kind of leads, uh, lead into this from where we were. What would your fantasy wicket be had you played in Australia's golden era? So if you were playing, let's say, 15 or 20 years ago, he was throwing out some names like... Uh, Tendulka, but we know you've already got him out. Tendulka, Lara, uh, Ponting even. Who would you most like to bowl to and most like to get out in that kind of era of cricket where you were growing up? Yeah, um, you've, you've probably nailed a couple there, but I'd also like to have got Justin Langer out, uh, my old coach, and then the coach of Australia, so that would have been pretty <laughs> cool. Um, but yeah, bowling to even just bowling to guys like Brian Lara, um, Ricky Ponting, those sort of things are um, it's testing yourself against the best. Um, and that's, that's one of the most exciting things about our game is when you come up against the best cricketers, how do you go and, and yeah, can you get them out or, or how does it work? So um, yeah, mm. some of those guys will be it, that's for sure. Yeah, well, I mean, it, obviously that time's changed so quickly and, and we've had a lot of player turnover in the last 10 years, but we have seen uh, players like yourself step up and put in some really good performances for the national team. And of course, now with these opportunities all around the world to advance your cricket and keep learning. So thank you. That's TK. And he, he's one of our regulars. So you can give TK a little hello and thanks for watching. It's always fantastic thanks, to, have, to have you with us. Now, another question's come in, guys. You can put them in the question uh, mark bar down the bottom or you can put them in the comments. Let's just keep the conversation rolling here. We've got a few good ones here, actually. But I'm, try, I'm trying to keep them fair you know, so that the answer won't take the whole hour. Um, but we do have a question from Bo Solomon and he would like to know what is the fastest ball you've bowled? And some people, they're obsessed with the speed gun, aren't they? And they want to know how fast they can bowl. So tell me what yeah, the fastest ball you've bowled is. Do you know? Um, the fastest ball I've been recorded to have bowled uh, was at the Adelaide Oval in the T20 game. Um, and I don't think the radar was off, but I've been told it has because it clocked me about 150 k's an hour. Wow. Wow. Um, so I don't think I've actually bowled that fast, but uh, I usually sit somewhere between um, the mid to high 130s and I've, I've been known occasionally to notch into the one, low 140s. Yeah, well, you know, it, and it, I guess some days you feel better than others, maybe the conditions. Uh, it's one of those things, isn't it, with speed? And it's, again, it's a fairly recent thing into the game that we actually know bowlers' speeds. So there's a lot of conjecture about how fast you know, people like Jeff Thompson were on a consistent basis and, and Dennis Lilly, but it's interesting now to have that that metric uh, to, to measure your speed. But a um, follow-up question to that, do you think there is a relationship between how fast you're bowling and your ability to swing the ball? Because a lot of people think that um, to swing the ball, you need to take a little bit of pace off and, and get the mechanics and the, and the physics of, sp of swinging the ball quite right. Yeah, I, I think that's part of it. Um, I think you see a lot of the out-and-out -out fast bowlers that bowl 150k an hour plus don't generally swing the ball as much. Um, so maybe there is a sweet spot somewhere between 130 and 140 or 145 or something like that. Um, but it, it's a lot to do with swing bowling. There's so many elements to it. Um, there's wrist position, there's seam position, uh, there's all the atmospheric conditions as well, the pitch conditions, um, even the, the ball itself. Um, some balls feel better in the hand and some balls just swing more than others for no apparent reason. Um, so it's it's yeah I, I guess I can can say it because I do it sometimes but it's it's quite a tough art um, and and something that 
yeah, it's um, when you can can do it and, and swing the ball consistently, it's a, it's a really good feeling. And um, those days when you feel in rhythm and, and everything seems to click uh, like with any sport or with anything, really, it's it's the days where things feel a bit more effortless and, and you feel like everything's in your control and, and you've almost got the ball on a string. Those are the days that you, yeah, you really look forward to. Yeah, definitely. And, and this is something from a practical point of view, um, as, as one of the opening bowlers normally in, in the team, now, do you have any say in which ball you actually choose? Because often the umpires will give you a selection of, of how does that work? You get a, a few balls to choose from and, and who's in charge of that process? Yeah, so we do. The, uh, the third umpire uh, will come up to the bowling group generally or someone in the bowling group um, with a box of new balls. So there's generally 12 balls in that box. And depending on which team you're in um, is there's different people within different teams that pick the balls. Um, so I've been able to pick the ball in some teams and, and not in others because some guys um, definitely have to do it and those sort of things. But if you chat to a lot of the fast bowlers, um, a lot of guys are looking for similar things, balls that feel nice in the hand, that when you flick it up, generally the seam will sit upright. Um, and also um, generally the, the quarter seams, especially in white ball cricket, the quarter seams are really closed and, and close together. Sure. Well, yeah, that's an interesting insight. And that's, of course, something a lot of our fans wouldn't know about the, uh, the practicalities of what goes on before an international cricket match. Now, Syram, he's also a bit of a regular here in the European Cricket Studio. And he's asking um, a question about what difference do you feel bowling in Indian conditions compared to Australian pitches? So is there, is there a certain different mindset or anything that you do differently depending on if you're playing on an Indian pitch versus, say, an Australian pitch? Yeah, you certainly do, because um, generally in Australia, our wickets um, have a bit more bounce in them. Um, so the lengths that you're going to bowl in Australia are generally slightly different to India. So <clears throat> most of the time when we're playing in India, we're having to draw our length back a fraction and really hit the wicket hard. Um, and the batters in India are so good as well that if you miss slightly full, then generally you, you turn around and you see the ball disappearing over your, over the top of your head. Um, so that's that's probably a part of it, but also... Um, the thing I've learned over the, the past year or two is that um, your change-ups are so important, especially in India, because um, the wickets can be variable and, and you can actually get quite a lot out of your change-ups as well. Yeah, and of course that variety is, is so important. And I think you talked about on Tuesday the importance of having a plan but executing the plan. So it's one thing mm. to have a plan but actually actually doing it. So it's fine to have all the plans in the world, but if you can't execute them and set the right fields to them, then you're, you're going to have a tough time. Yeah, that's exactly right. So, um, oh, yeah, you really hit the nail on the head. You can have a plan, but if you can't execute it, then it's no good. And um, that's where you see the best bowlers in the world have, have really good plans and they execute it nine times out of ten. So, yeah, that's really um, really what sets the best to, uh, from the rest. Absolutely. Now, uh, we actually have got quite a few, quite a few questions from some kids as well uh, oh, coming cool. in, various, various uh, different platform so the easiest way to get the questions if, if they're in advance is to just to uh, send them to at european cricket league on twitter or instagram or you can even send them to me at mr matt Samo. uh so this one actually came in from a young man and his name is Brody, and he's six years old and he's he's from london england and he wants to know what's it like <laughs> being famous well you should probably ask someone that is famous um <laughs> Oh, yeah, I, I wouldn't class myself as famous, to be honest with you. Um, but, yeah, chatting to guys that are famous, um, it is it is good and bad because um, a, a lot of the time um, some guys just want to be able to sit back and relax or go out somewhere um, and not be, not be in the public eye, so to speak. So it can be tough, but it also has lots of positives. Um, the big one that I... I really take on is that we're all um, role models, which is something that's that's really important. So, for Brody, for example, by the sounds of it, um, he might like his like his cricket and, and follow a fair few cricketers and, and definitely have a few favourite players. And um, there's kids all around the world that have favourite favourite players in any sport, and um, and, and those sort of things are really um, important. Um, and for our society to have good role models, whether it be in sport or business or wherever it might be, um, is really important. So that's that's something that I, I take out of it. If um, That if people see me as famous or 
at least if they see me as a good role model, then hopefully I'm doing my job. Yeah, and you are a very good role model. I do have to say that. Um, although you've had some, some <laughs> run-ins with the fans, tell us a story about how when you were in India, and of course, you know, Indians love their cricket, and they generally love uh, Australian cricketers when, they, when they're touring the country. But didn't you have an incident where you were sitting in a bus and something quite surprising happened? Yeah, so that was in, um, I'm pretty sure it was Guwahati. Um, this was the second T20, <clears throat> second T20 match in the my debut series, actually, uh, in India. So the first match was just about a washout. We got um, just enough of a game in for India to beat us, unfortunately. Um, and then the second game, we came out all guns blazing and, I knew that we really had to, I guess, put the put the foot down, and um, I ended up taking four wickets that night, um, and we had a, a quite a good win. Um, and then so we're on the bus on the way back to the hotel, and I was turning, a, I turned around from my seat. I was chatting to Glenn Maxwell and having a good chat and a few laughs on the bus, and everyone's pretty jovial and and having a good time because we had a had a good win. And and next minute, um, oh sorry, I'll. I'll go back, uh, I digress a, a touch and say I was sitting on the inside seat um, so no one was sitting next to me on the window my bag was there. As I was turning around chatting to Maxi, we hear this bang like a gunshot um, and then next thing I know, there was a rock, a massive, probably about that size rock um, just on the floor near my near my staff. So um, yeah, fortunately no one was injured, there was no no issues apart from a giant hole in the window and um, a few boys, yeah, probably a little bit um, taken aback by that. And But then also within 30 seconds, blokes have been taking photos and putting it on social media and, and stuff like that. So it was, um, yeah, a pretty, pretty surreal experience and, um, yeah, one I certainly wouldn't like to have to do again, that's for sure. Definitely. I mean, yeah, very, very scary. I mean, I, thinking of that incident, I just was happy it wasn't Mitch Marsh that was uh, sitting there because, you know, he has the, the biggest head <laughs> of any cricketer in the world. That's the way I think they call yeah, him bison because he's got a yeah, giant head. Yeah, we actually head. weighed it. <laughs> you yeah, you so, weighed it? How do you weigh yeah. a head? So there, off, was, no, so there was a, a Shield game that we were playing in um, or it might have been a one-day game in Sydney where we had a rain delay um, and what else do you do to pass the time but get the scales out and, and weigh blokes' heads. So there was a, a quite a specific system where you'd lie down on the ground, you'd um, be elevated... To, to make sure that your head was level with the scales um, and then you'd place your head on the scale and, and someone would be there um, as the adjudicator to weigh the heads. Um, Mitch Marsh was definitely the heaviest, but also Cameron Bancroft. How, mu how, how, how much of it is brain though with Mitch? That's what I wonder. It's probably a big skull maybe, but... Look, I'm not, of, I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> I'm not going to comment on that one. Um, I'll just say that Mitch is a very smart individual. He's the captain of our state. He does a very good job. So we'll leave it at that. Very um, diplomatic. Yeah. But Cameron Bancroft also has a very heavy head. Um, this was mainly due to the boys revving bangers up a little bit and actually putting their hand on it as he had his head down <laughs> to make him think that he had a really heavy head. He got quite upset about it as well. <laughs> oh, dear me. Uh, wow. That's, well, that's, it just shows you the, the inner sanctum, the kind of craziness get up to. Now, this is a question from Ethan, uh, who does his own podcast, the Centre Wicket Podcast. Uh, Ethan, it's great to have you on the show. And he would like to know, uh, kind of getting past the whole fame uh, aspects that you, you're dealing with right now, but what can you see yourself doing after your cricket life? Uh, there's a few things that I've, um, I guess I've been interested in. I've, I've got a, a human movement and sports science degree at uni. I finished that a few years ago and um, it's something that I am quite interested in. Um, and also moving a little bit further forward, what I've started to do over the last uh, maybe a couple of years um, is take an interest in, in real estate. Uh, so I quite enjoy real estate. I've got my property sales and management license as well and um, it's something that, that interests me and um, could see myself potentially going into to somewhere around there, but also what you're doing at the moment, actually, in the media space, um, commentary, um, anything in front of the camera, even some stuff behind it. Um, that's That's been quite uh, exciting as well, being uh, involved with uh, the Australian team, but also with the Perth Scorchers. We do a fair bit of media, um, and I've really quite enjoyed that as well. Yeah, well, you know, actually, I, I should have thought to put this on the show, but I actually watched one of your interviews from, I think it was BBL2, 
back in around 2011, 2012. And let me just say, your media has improved a lot since then. <laughs> <laughs> I think you were 20 or 21 and yeah. it wasn't easy to watch. But, you know, now that you're a more refined, experienced gentleman, we're getting a lot of comments here saying that uh, you could perhaps consider a career in modelling. I don't know if that's something that you've, you've considered. Wow. I don't know if that you've got a very oval head. I think. Yeah, that, I don't know whether that works for modeling, does it? But they like some unusual looks in modeling, I think. You know, you've got a, you've got a million dollar go. smile. You've got a million dollar smile. We even had some people asking, you know, that Jack Leach from England is, has a deal with spec savers. So perhaps oh, yeah. you could chase that now that you've got the, you've got the spectacles on there. So, yeah, uh, the, the only problem is I wouldn't get photo, uh, photographed in them playing cricket because uh, I can't, can't bowl in specs. So. Um, yeah, you never know. Never say it's, never. Hey, it's, 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 this is real. This is real time feedback. You can't <coughs> fake. So you can get a lot of uh, positive feedback about your looks, Jason. So <laughs> well, we know you more than a pretty face, though, and you do have that degree and something to fall back on. But yeah, I think it's definitely uh, uh, after your cricket days, you've got a lot of potential in the media arena, and so that would be that'd be really cool. Now we, I'm going to get some more questions here, guys. Keep them coming in. It's really fantastic. Even let us know where you're watching from around the world, or if you've got any other questions. For Jason, put them in the comments or put them in the question bar. Now, this is this one did come in, actually, and I'll be very curious to see what you uh, have to say about this one, if I can pull it up. And this one's come in from at Style by Javel. When are you going <laughs> to finish renovating my wardrobe? What's going on here? Well, well uh, we started a little project today. Javel um, has been keen for a while to update her wardrobe because at the moment or well, actually no at the moment it's a bare room because we demolished it today um so she had a basically it was a v-shaped shelf and some railings underneath it and that was about it so it was a very basic wardrobe from when we moved into the house um so she bought a few um, cupboards and cabinets and that sort of thing to put in there to try and fill it out but didn't really cut the gravy um as such so she was she was wanting to to do something a little bit more so um in the coming days i think she'll probably be posting a little bit about it uh, we took some photos today of um, us with a sledgehammer and a saw and a drill and i was, all those I was gonna things. ask about the sledgehammer now where, how did yeah. the sledgehammer come into the equation and who and who because uh, i've seen you with the bat and i'm not going to make any comment on that but how did you go with the sledgehammer? Did you were you in control? Was Juve in control? What was going on? Um, well, Javel really wanted to hit something with a sledgehammer, so I let her do uh, the majority <laughs> of the sledgehammer work. So she was really excited about it. Um, maybe it's something that's been on her bucket list for a while. I don't know. Um, but so yeah, we we took it apart today. Um, there was a few little bits that were were tricky to get out of the wall just because of the way. It was put together, uh, stuck into the wall in certainly some strange and wonderful ways. But now we managed to get there and we puttied up the holes and, uh, and then we'll give it a little bit of a paint and, and put some new shelving in and a few drawers and hangers and all that sort of stuff. And yeah, within hopefully the next day or two, Javel will have a, a fantastic new wardrobe that you can show off, show everyone on social media. And you never know, I might get a little bit of credit too. Oh, well, yeah, don't hold your breath. Um, <laughs> so, so uh, we had another question from Siren, and it's basically about swing bowling. And he says that he, he generally swings the ball into the batsman, uh, but he has trouble controlling it, and he has to slow the ball down. Now, this is a bit difficult uh, to answer in, in a simple fashion, I'm sure. But um, my question uh, following on from that, uh, you're predominantly, I'd call, out swing bowler, um, as in the ball swings left to right because you're left-handed. Um, do you feel that bowlers generally fall into either outswing or in-swing kind of bowlers? Um, or do you think it is something that you can develop? Because um, I can't remember you with a new ball bowling too many balls that swing the other way. So what's your opinion on that? Yeah, I, I think generally uh, the way either you're made up or the wrist position that you've got, the, your action, um, there's a lot of determining factors into the way you can swing the ball. But generally your your action will predispose you to an in-swing or an out-swing bowler. Um, and that's something that you, you get from your action. Um, there's not too many guys that can genuinely swing the ball both ways. Um, the best one that comes to mind for me is James Anderson. Um, so he, he can do it at will, um, bowl, bowl with good pace and, and swing the ball whichever way he likes. Um, but most guys are predominantly one way. 
um, and then their either change up or, or something else is is maybe one that straightens or holds the line as opposed to swinging big the other way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, interesting, isn't it? Sometimes you wonder if if uh, swing bowlers are born, not made, because it has to have a lot to do with your natural action. And swing bowling is still, we, we, a lot of science has come into the game, but swing bowling is one of those areas, it's a little bit uh, unexplainable at times, isn't it? Like we all seem to know that uh, cloud cover, the ball seems to swing more, but no one can really pin down why that is. It's just some things that we've noticed over the years. So, yeah, it's one of the, still one of the great mysteries of cricket, I think, swing, swing bowling. Yeah, exactly right. Um, and that's, like I said, the um, one of the days that everything goes really well and the ball swings perfectly and, um, and yeah, everything goes to plan are the days that you, you really want to have and, and the days that you make sure that you enjoy when you get that chance because then the next day it might not swing at all and, and suddenly it's not as much fun. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we've got a question here. This actually came from my colleagues at, at European Cricket and they would like to know if you have an opinion <laughs> on this. This actually came from one of the guys in the office. So what do you think of the golden ball tiebreaker employed in the recent Dream 11 European Cricket Series? Now, do you even, have you even heard of the, the golden ball tiebreaker, Jason? Um, I did get a little bit of a forewarning about this one. Um, so you mentioned it to me a little bit this afternoon. So um, you might have to explain it in greater detail so that I can fully grasp well, it, though. Not, not at all. So um, because of the, the time restrictions and all that, to break ties in the, uh, the T10 games in the Dream 11 European Cricket Series um, and in the European Cricket League, once we get restarted again, the batting team will continue and get to face one more ball and they have to score two runs off that ball to win the game. And if they fail to score two runs, they don't win the game. The fielding team wins the game. Um, and anyone can face the ball as long as they haven't been dismissed in the innings. So I guess as a bowler, uh, you're trying to restrict the batsman to one run or no runs ideally, and then you'll win the game. But if they get two runs or more, then the batting team will win the game. So instinctively, who do you think this favours, uh, if anybody, and would you back yourself with the ball to restrict the batsman to one run or less? Uh, well, first, yes, I'd definitely back myself with the ball. Um, in, in this scenario, whoever's bowling the last over, do they continue and bowl the extra ball or can anybody right. bowl the extra ball? Yeah, so in fact, you'd probably be off the hook because I haven't seen you bowl too many uh, final overs in any innings. But uh, yeah, it is whoever bowls the last, the last uh, ball of the innings has to bowl one more. So yeah, yeah. So, so, so do you think as a bowler, it's a, fair, it's a pretty fair contest? I think it could be. Um, it's, it's something that the, with the way the field restrictions are, it's, it's quite a, I reckon it's quite a, a good opportunity there to, if you, if you bowl the ball that you want to bowl and you, you execute your plan, um, you should hopefully be able to get a dot ball or a single. Um, if the, the, I suppose the, the tough one there is that if the ball gets hit into the outfield, um, that's a good chance for the, the batting team to get two, um, but also a good chance for a run out. So there's, I, I think it, it, it's a good way to finish a game by the sounds of it um, with very restricted time. Yeah, and of course, it's the exact situation we had in the uh, Cricket World Cup last year in the final where Martin Guptill had to score two runs off the last mm. ball to win the World Cup for New Zealand. And he got run out by, you know, about probably a foot or probably it felt like a just, yard just or Just enough, less. wasn't it? Yeah. Just enough. And that was the difference. The line was the difference between the World Cup going to New Zealand or England. So uh, I think that is an interesting point you make about the ball going to the outfield um, creates maybe this 50-50 scenario where the fielding team are going to have to make the run out to, to win the game. So um, we have only had one of them so far, and the batsman uh, edged it over the third man who was in the circle and went for four, and he was, he yeah. was carried off by his teammates. Uh, that was in, the, that was in the, the, re, the recent uh, Dream 11 European Cricket Series in Spain. So he was a hero that day. But, yeah, it would be interesting to see if that's something uh, that we see more of, and we'll keep a tally, batsmen versus bowlers, uh, for the golden balls. Now, I need you to do something for me now, Jason. Just uh, sure. very easy. So this is for all our viewers here. And if you're new, don't forget to follow at European Cricket and check out our website, um, ecn.cricket, www.ecn.cricket, because we have an opportunity for some people to win uh, some things this weekend. We actually have a quiz starting this weekend, and it opens at 6 a.m. on uh, Saturday morning in Europe and 
finishes at 6 p.m. Uh, Sunday evening in Europe. And it's very easy. It's just six questions, six questions, and all the answers are on the website. But we do have a potential advantage for those people watching this show and they can win a fantastic pair of cricket shoes from painter and i'll put a picture up in, in a little while about that but we just thought it would be nice to reward our viewers and I'm, we're going to do a segment called random household object r-h-o okay. as i call it and so what i'd like <laughs> you to do without and it can be anything you like can you go find something from your house a random household object and bring it back and something you're happy to share with us in front of the camera so just any sort of object that's lying around your house and this could potentially i'm not going to say it will be this week but potentially could be in the quiz uh that people can can, can win this uh, these pair of cricket shoes so there you go i'll give you i'll give you i'll give you 60 seconds you with me or okay oh, no, you, go you, no, you go on 60 seconds i'm just going to do a bit of a, a shout out to some of the people watching cloudy welcome <laughs> cloudy says she wants to weigh right. my head yeah, see you, Jason, in a minute. Right. I think mine might be a little bit empty, Cloudy, but um, I, would, I would let you weigh my head. That's the first time I've ever been asked that. We've also uh, got a few uh, other people. Harindajit just says that he's from India and Jason is his favourite fast bowler. That's wonderful, Harindajit. I wonder who your favourite IPL team. Are you, are you a Mumbai supporter or are you perhaps somebody else? Now, uh, Bishta Tool 50 has said she wants to know whether Jason would choose the Perth Scorchers or the Mumbai Indians. So we might have to ask him that when he gets back. Um, and hello to Hayley. She's saying hello. And um, there's a few uh, stories about Jason's injuries. And, and uh, his, his, yeah, he did have an operation, uh, at the, I think, at the beginning of this season. It was, as he said earlier, it was the same operation that uh, Australian bowler James Pattinson has had, and he's come back fairly successfully. I think he actually flew to New Zealand for that. Um, Roger Feiner says he wants to know if wooden bats might be exchanged for other materials. Well, Roger, I can tell you that they, they tried that once. They tried an aluminium bat, but they immediately said, no, it damages the ball. So the, uh, they, wooden bats are now in the laws of cricket, and I can't see that changing anytime soon. All right, so Jason, welcome back. What Thank have you, you got for us? Random household objects. New segment. Well, it's very, top, very topical at the moment. Okay. Um, and it's hand sanitizer. Oh, that's very good. <laughs> <laughs> I've got mine here as well. There you go. Have you got yours? Oh, I, got well, well played. I got them at the shops here. Yeah. I, you know, so there you go, guys. So if that is in the question, is this, if that is the question for the ECN.cricket quiz this week, don't forget, head to the website. Saturday and Sunday, answer six questions and you can win the, uh, the fantastic prize, brand new pair of painter uh, cricket shoes. I will have the picture up at the end. Then if you need to say, if that's a question, random household object is hand sanitizer. Actually, speaking of that, Jason, we've had a lot of questions about how you're dealing with isolation and we got into it a little bit the other night. But mm -hmm. um, just give us a brief overview of, of what you're doing just to stay sane and how your life's changed recently taking a sledgehammer to my wife's wardrobe today. Um, <laughs> uh, but no, so we, we have been doing a few little um, projects around the house. So the wardrobe being one of them, um, a few other little things, tidying different areas up and reorganising some of the rooms and things like that. So general stuff that when you're busy and when you're working and, and doing all those sort of things, um, you don't really have time for. So um, or if you have spare time, you don't want to do that sort of stuff. So we're trying to get a, a few of those things done and get the house in a, I guess, a bit of order that we've we've had a, a few things that, a few little projects that we've wanted to do, like put paintings up on the walls and, and things like that. So we're, we're starting to, to get through a few of those jobs, which is really cool. Well, yeah, you're all doing crazy things at the moment. I'm talking to you here you know, almost in the middle of the night to a bunch of people around the world. I wasn't expecting to be doing this. Yeah. Here's a question from Harish. Now, Harish... Uh, is a bit of a cricket tragic from Germany. He wants to know, can you speak any German? Nein. <laughs> you just did. Uh, so are, are there any other languages you can speak? I mean, you, you've got English uh, down eventually, which is good. Yeah, starting, <laughs> starting to get a bit of that. <laughs> um, I did Japanese in school. Um, ah, so I me could too. say, so um, Watashi wa Jason des. Ah, dozio um, Yeah, that's I, yeah, that's I also, of it. Yeah, especially the binkyo shimashita. 
Of course, that means I studied at school and you're looking at me blankly. And I actually finished school a long time before you did, so let's not forget about that. Uh, we had yeah. some questions the other night. Uh, various ones came in. I'll, I'll just provide a brief snapshot about you and spicy food and how do you handle Indian food? Do you eat Indian food? Have you eaten Indian food in India? How did that go? Um I do eat Indian food in India. I actually really enjoy Indian food. Um, I don't enjoy the super spicy ones, um, but a lot of the uh, a lot of the curries or um, the different foods that I've eaten in India, um, I haven't obviously gone for the super spicy ones like yourself. In you really enjoy those, but um, thrill seeker. Yeah, the ones that I've had. Um, the flavor is amazing. So there is a, a, a good element of spice to it. Um, but yeah, Indian food's delicious. It is, it is good, isn't it? And um, did you notice the food changing as you went region to region? Or is that something that uh, it's a bit too subtle for you to pick up? No, we did. Um, I, I, I can't actually remember which regions um, went, went to sort of which which types of food, um, but especially... You go around so fast, don't you, when you're playing a couple <laughs> yeah. of days here? You can't remember where you are, I'm sure. Yeah, but um, we were very fortunate when travelling with the Australian team, we had a chef with us, so he'd tell us um, in this state or in this city, um, these are the delicacies, these are the things to go for. If you want to try something new, try this. Um, so that was something that was really, oh, really cool because um, in each each spot we got to try something different if, if you wanted to. Um, yeah, so that was really nice. Are there any guys like, you know, Warney was famous for shipping in the, the baked beans and, the, and trying to get a pizza wherever he went. Are there any yeah. guys currently in the setup that you play with that just, it's just a non-starter for them? They're just trying to find a burger. Is there anyone just um, not, not on with the program? <laughs> yeah, just really quickly, I've seen on the, uh, the chat come through uh, one of my mates, Carl, who's living in Singapore is on the chat. So that's, that's pretty cool. Ah, well, hello, Carl, nice to see yeah. you. And actually, um, Vince Sandu, that's my cousin watching from Malaysia. And he's a big cricket oh, fan as well. Malaysia's developing there you market. Go. Um, so tell me, who, who's no good with, with uh, kind of foreign foods in the Australian setup um, at the moment? Uh, well, he's just got back into the Australian setup, Jai Richardson. Um, oh. He is a plain Jane burger eating machine. Um, he doesn't really branch out. He likes his, <laughs> his chicken schnitzel or his, his basic food. So uh, he's one that, that generally won't steer to too far from the tree oh there you go you heard it here first you guys um now we had a question while you were going to get the hand sanitizer which just to remind <laughs> everyone to remember that for the quiz potentially um mumbai indians or per, mumbai indians or per scorchers if you had to choose one who are you choosing good luck it's like choosing Ooh. between children i'm sure yeah that's that's really tough um both extremely successful franchises both a lot of fun to play for um do I have to choose Vinny? This is really tough. Yes, you know, you asked the question, but you can... Uh, I feel like there's no way you're going to answer, but I like putting you on the spot because I like watching you squirm. So go on. Yeah, I, I, I really can't because I uh, I can't choose between the two. I'd have to play for both of them, cut myself in half and play for both. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Well, you know what? <laughs> I sometimes do call you the modern day Bruce Reed, former Australian fast bowler made famous by the 12th man. Uh, Billy Birmingham for being held together with sticky tape. <laughs> but your spine, it's not sticky tape now. We've come a long way. There's some sort of wires holding it together. But it's just, yeah, it's it's just the modern day <laughs> sticky tape, isn't it? Yeah, it's something like that. So it's some screws and some wire hopefully holding me in place. And ideally, that'll keep me on the park. That'd be really nice. <laughs> Definitely. Now, I had a question come in uh, from Malaysia, actually, that said, what is the atmosphere like at the Wankhede Stadium in Mumbai? But, uh, what is that yeah. like when that's packed out? That's electric. Um, it's an unbelievable stadium to play at. Um, such passionate fans all throughout India. Um, but the thing that playing in the IPL um, was actually getting a chance to to play for a team where everyone in the stadium or at least 50% of the stadium was cheering for you as opposed to everyone against us when they're, wherever yeah. they're playing for Australia. Sure. Um, so that, that was surreal. And I got to bowl... Um, opening the bowling for Mumbai and, and just the roar in the stadium when the game's about to start. Um, and even things like when, when we're batting, guys like Rohit Sharma hits a boundary and the whole stadium erupts. Like you feel like the roof's going to jump off. And, sure. um, and you, you get such a, such a buzz from that as a player. Um, and that's where you talk 
um, to anyone throughout the world in sport, um, home court advantage, home ground advantage has such a, a real um, effect because, yeah, getting getting into a full stadium with everyone cheering for you um, and having all your fans go absolutely nuts for everything that you do really lifts you. Um, so and those are the things that, that you get playing elite sport, um, playing in front of big crowds is some of the, uh, the most exhilarating and, and fun things I've ever been able to do. Yeah, what an experience. Um, Ibrahim's just joined and wants to say, wants to shout out. Say hello, welcome to the chat. We hope there you follow is. at European Cricket and uh, thanks for joining us in the European Cricket Studio tonight. And it's so great to have such an amount of questions. We're not going to be able to get to all of them, but we're getting to as many as we can. Now, this one came in and it's a little bit topical. This came actually from one of our uh, regulars, Ram. He says, what do you think about me as a person taking on a show? Do you have an opinion? Of course, we, were, we are former teammates <laughs> a while ago now, and I did take my favourite catch ever off you, but I, you know, I'll, I'll, the whole hour I could talk about that, so I'm not going to talk about that too much. But, I mean, if you want to talk about it, uh, what do you think about me taking on a show then? Go on. Here's a picture of us. Oh, there you go. Yeah, that's pretty cute. I like that. Um, Some wacker? Uh, uh, I, th I think it's excellent, Vin. One, because you have such a, a vast knowledge of everything, so you can talk about anything, um, and you can also talk underwater. So that's, that's a talent in itself. So I think you hosting a show is perfect. We might have to soon with rising sea levels. You know, maybe all the shows <laughs> will be done underwater. So you know, I'm really enjoying it, guys, and it's so, so great to have so many people tuning in, and it's great to have Jason on the show. And I've got a great guest on next week. I've got Eugene Molly on, who I call the Flying Bus, and he plays for Svanholm in Denmark. And he's got a very interesting story. Uh, also, Michael McCann will be back Monday and Wednesday with Joe Gatting, who's the nephew of Mike Gatting. And uh, Joe is the captain of Swartzen, who actually qualified for the ECL this year. It's been postponed. And also, I've got to shout out that there's a huge announce announcement coming on Monday on Michael's show regarding ECL 21. So make sure that you don't miss that. Now, I've got a final one, and this, this one was a funny one. I didn't have time to put it up, but do you, th do you think you must sign a few autographs, right? As, you know, you, now you admitted you're famous, so that, <laughs> that, that, you, that we've got that on tape. Do you yeah. think, do you think um, that your autographs should be worth more because your name is so long? Yes. <laughs> 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 no, no it's, it it's something that. Do you? How much of the name are you putting down? Because Berendorf, I mean, you must have this issue your whole life of just having to fill out forms and stuff. That is yeah. The, going... the worst was actually. Do you remember those tests in school where you had to fill in the bubbles for each letter <laughs> of your name? That was an absolute killer. Sometimes you don't actually put your name on there. So that was the worst. But <laughs> it's time to exam. Uh, yeah, you're exactly. still trying to see your name. Well, that's oh, wow. the thing. And they say, oh, you've got 60 minutes. And you take 20 minutes of your time to actually <laughs> fill in your name, for goodness sake. Oh, you would have no. needed all the help you could get, I'm sure, as yeah. well. Yeah. Oh, jeez. Um, yeah. But no, so I've, I've abbreviated my name in my signature, um, mainly because uh, it's a lot easier to do a bulk, um, a lot of signatures to do because at the start of every season um, with WA, every time you play for Australia, every time you play for, for anyone, basically, um, there's a lot of bat stickers and shirts and, and memorabilia that you need to sign. So, um, yeah, and, and I also found a way to do it to, I, I think it looks a lot nicer than what I would have been able to do if I had to extend it out and, and write my whole last name. So, yeah, it's sort of a couple Smart of things play. that made it All a right. bit shorter. All right, just got time for maybe one more question. This one came in as well um, quite late in the game. Give us some an example of someone who is quite different in private than they are than perhaps their public persona. Maybe someone you've played with or against. Can you, does anyone oh, spring wow. to mind that, 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 that they're quite different when you get to know them to, to uh, what the public perception is? Um, I can't think of anyone right now off the top of my head, but you, you do get um, quite a few guys that are, are more introverted um, that are really happy in their own space but have to put on a bit of a persona or have to put on, um, yeah, a bit of a bravado or something to get themselves up for games or to to fill that public profile that they feel like they might have or they might need Um yeah, so unfortunately, yeah, no one comes to mind exactly, but it's, yeah, it, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of guys that are slightly 
different from one to another, which to be fair as well is, is something that's probably quite natural because um, you can't be high energy and, and everything all the time. So it's, um, yeah, it's one of those things, isn't it? You, you got to pick your moments and you got to relax as well. Sure. And look, Banu is, is, is yelling this at us. So let's get a quick 20 second opinion on Zoinus. Of course, that's Marcus Zoinus and, and Adam Zampa <laughs> and, and they're quite interesting relationship. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, it's a beautiful relationship. Um, they're very close. They're, well, they love each other, actually. I think, um, yeah, it's many it's Many types of love. Love is love. Love is love. Yeah, and I've, I learned even more watching the test documentary on Amazon about, about them and, and um, Adam with his, his coffee. He's like quite a, it's quite hardcore, isn't yeah, he, with his coffee? his love cafe. I reckon we get on great. And Marcus, I've actually known Marcus. I used to coach him when he was about nine or ten years old. And so, uh, yeah, I still see that little kid coming out in him sometimes. He's, <laughs> Doesn't mind a microphone, does he? I'll have to try and get him on the show, I think. Anyway, look, Jason, yeah. I just want to say thanks so much. I'm, I'm going to just kind of finish our chat in a second and I'll let, let our viewers know what's coming up next week on the European Cricket Studio. But just a final message for all the people who have tuned in tonight. Yeah, well, look, thank you so much. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be on with Mr. Maximo himself um, with the European Cricket Studio. And uh, it's something that, yeah, I love doing this sort of thing. So I'm, I'm happy to be on board and, yeah. Hopefully the, the shows continue to go really well and, and thanks to everyone for tuning in. I oh, appreciate it, Jason. And we uh, will see you soon on the cricket field. All right, Jason Berendorf. Thanks. thanks very much, Vinny. So guys, that was the end of our second week of European Cricket Studio. And coming up, just like I said, and as I promised you before, we have the huge ECN.Cricket weekend quiz. Now this is opening 6 a.m. Saturday and closes 6 p.m. Sunday. And the only way you can get involved is to go to the website, www.ecn.cricket. There's only six questions. It's a very simple process, and you could win those fantastic Painter X MK3 cricket shoes. The winner will be announced on This Is McCann on Monday's show on the European Cricket Studio. So we've got a fantastic week of entertainment for you coming up again, but make sure you jump on the website this weekend, Saturday and uh, Saturday or Sunday, get your entry in uh, to have a chance to win those fantastic brand new Painter cricket shoes. And thanks very much to Painter for supporting European cricket. And this is what's coming up next week. Don't forget Monday, a huge ECL 21 announcement from founder Daniel Weston. Now, Michael's guest on Monday and Wednesday next week will be Joe Gadding. As I said, that's the nephew of Mike Gadding. And he's the Swardson Crick Club captain, former first-class cricketer in England. And then on Tuesday and Thursday, I'll be having Eugene Molion. You might know him as the flying bus from Svanholm. And uh, we'll be having a very interesting chat about his background and how he got into European cricket and his thoughts about last year's ECL and thoughts moving forward. So from everyone at the European Cricket Studio Live, it's been fantastic to have your company. Thanks for joining us. Don't forget the quiz this weekend and then tune in on Michael for the European Cricket Live studio. But for now, keep hitting him high and handsome. Goodbye for now.